the first hot topic that we're going to talk about today is how prevalent Tread syndrome and tick disorders are in the population. Um, when Tread syndrome was first described um, in the late 1800s, it was considered a rare disorder and continued to be a rare disorder until the mid-1960s. Since that time, there's been a big change in, in uh, our understanding of how frequent or how common Tread syndrome is in the population. Dr. Scahill is a uh, epidemiologist and probably the best qualified at this table to kind of talk about the issues uh, with respect to the prevalence of ticks and Tourette's syndrome. Larry? Well, I think there's three um, sort of streams to think about. First, a big change occurred in 1980 when uh, the definition of Tourette was formally changed uh, in the DSM-3, as everybody remembers, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And that uh, effectively broadened the criteria for diagnosis. That was a big change. The other change came from family studies in which uh, people learned that there really is a range of expression of the disorder and, uh, and that the disorder shouldn't be just thought of as that most severe version of the of the condition. And then third and finally and probably most important is the uh, people going out and doing actual community surveys rather than just trying to collect up all the people that were coming to clinics and saying that's our numerator, that's our collection of cases and, and everybody else is in the denominator. Uh, so the result is, is that we learned first that there's a range from mild to severe and if we include those mild cases, the prevalence goes up. And uh, when we go out into the community, that's what we find, milder cases. So now we say that the um, prevalence of Tourette, uh, we used to say with conviction, one out of 2,000, one out of 2,500. Now we say more like 0.6% or six per thousand, which is which is a you know, much higher number. But in that number are many, many mild cases. Okay, so it, it's getting close to 1%. Getting close to 1%. Might have a tick disorder. Well, actually the 0.6 figure is for Tourette. So that's motor and phonic ticks that endure over time. Um, if we add in chronic ticks without the presence of both motor and phonic ticks, we can probably say another 0.6%. So when you combine them, that's 1.2%. Um, and uh, but again, that's accepting a wide range of severity from mild to severe. Okay. Does it matter how prevalent threat? I mean, who cares? What, what's the issue beyond just the actual number? Uh, two issues. Uh, one issue is is that is it possible that ticks or chronic ticks uh, serves as a marker for other kinds of problems that children might have? And I know that's some of what we'll be talking about today. And if that's true, then we do want to know who has chronic ticks. Uh, the second is a kind of a resource allocation issue. Uh, we'd like to know the prevalence in the community because we'd like to know what are the appropriate resources that need to be uh, allotted to the children that are affected by Tourette? You, you use the word marker. Yeah. What, what did you mean by the term marker? Well, I, I'll be interested in what other members of the panel say about this, but it, is it possible that, that the presence of enduring ticks is telling us that there's uh, perhaps uh, other problems that go along with having that perhaps mild dysregulation in the brain that, that may serve as a reminder of other kinds of difficulties that the children have. Problems with attention, problems with impulse control, uh, and uh, problems with learning or other kinds of issues that may be more important. And so the tick is just the marker for looking for those other problems. So even if the kid had a mild tick or, or kind of infrequent ticks, it might mean that he has something else that might actually be more significant or more impairing? Is, is that what yes. you're saying? Yes. So there are, are now our community surveys that show that even the presence of mild ticks can be associated with other kinds of problems, particularly in the areas of inattention, impulse control, and learning. Anya, Kathy, any thoughts? Uh, I could speak to... Um what I see with the parents, uh, they're, um, a lot of times their biggest concern is the prognosis and, and where is this going to lead for the child. 
And a lot of uh, parents have the concern that this is going to develop into full-blown Tourette's with the cursing and all that, and they foresee that future for their child. So, they, so they're pretty worried. So the prevalence estimates might be helpful to them that kind of simple tics or transient tics are fairly common. And they go away and that the more severe Tourette's is fa fairly rare. It's not uncommon for me to have families who uh, or parents and often maybe fathers who, who have ongoing tics that are very apparent to me and have no knowledge of their ever having had tics at all. And they're exactly. blinking and they're, they're ticking and they're jerking their heads and I ask do they know anybody else in the family with tic disorders and they're kind of blinking. Like, I can't think of anybody. Yeah, and, I, I uh, see that all the time. I do too and so um, I, I think that uh, it's, it's often it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good for comic relief and it's a good teaching point too uh, in, in the clinical setting. Is there any point in making them aware of that tick at that point in time, or should you simply ignore it just as they have for all these years? That, that's a very tricky question, because depending on the family dynamics, mm -hmm. you could lose that patient forever mm -hmm. if you suddenly alert. There's a lot of guilt associated with believing that you've passed on this <coughs> genetic illness to your child. And so I think it's very delicate whether you deliver that news at the time of the initial consultation. Is there, is there some estimate uh, about the number of cases that when they do move into adulthood have a more severe or progressive course? Do we have some idea from kind of clinical studies about how common that is? Well, as you, Picking up on Tanya's point that that's what a lot of families are worried about. Yeah. I'll just say one comment and I'd love to hear from others, but uh, we've done two studies on that at Yale and we've shown that when you look at young people that are 18, in general, the majority of the, of the cases, their tics will be better than when they were 12. The curious thing about that is, is that their severity at 12 was not predictive of the severity at 18. So some kids with severe tics at 12 had fewer no ticks at age 18. And some with more ticks at age 18 didn't have the severe form when they were 12. Since we know that so many of these cases uh, have some comorbidity, let's say ADHD or OCD, much of the, uh, that course of the illness, how do you provide a prognosis for the parents? Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because the, you know, all of the discussion that we've had thus far has been the trajectory of the ticks. In the, in, the, in the studies that we've done where we've looked at the kids at age 12 and then early adulthood, the predictor of functional outcome, how well they were doing in school or in a job, was the presence of ADHD. ADHD is, is a predictor of poorer outcomes, regardless of the severity of ticks. Do you think it progresses, or, or are there are different subtypes? Well, I think that ADHD has a bigger impact on development all the way around. So these kids are, uh, don't do as well in school, have more problems socially, have more problems in uh, occupational environments. And so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a disorder that persists. Uh, I don't know if it's progressive, but it persists. Yes, I would please. also uh, ask um, Larry of you, uh, when, we, when we look at the functional outcome of, of kids who have associated ADHD, who have been, who have been diagnosed as having ADHD, um, do we study the, do we, do, we, do we divide, do we try to take a look at those, those aspects of ADHD that, uh, that have qualified a specific diagnosis? You know, I, I believe that we don't have the fine-grained data to, to get it, you know, which part of ADHD is more predictive of poorer outcomes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's always been kind of the clinical rule that we've used is we've, I, people come to us because we have expertise around ticks, um, but oftentimes the most impairing condition or the issues that are really going to have lifelong impact are often not the ticks. Often when a child will come in, I'll ask them, what bothers you the most? Mm. I know your teacher's most upset about your ADHD. I know your parents are most upset about your tics. But what is making your life miserable on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think that's a pretty important question to ask, and often it's actually obsessive compulsive disorder. What, what about an adult? How, how do adults answer that question? Uh, it's interesting. Frequently, again, ADHD is very, very difficult to live with, but it pretty much makes life difficult for the others around that person. <laughs> Obsessive-compulsive symptoms, on the other 
and are really disabling, particularly when they're severe. I, I find that to be the case almost to a patient when I see adults uh, right up to age 60 uh, who have a moderate to severe symptoms. In almost every instance, they have an anxiety disorder and most often OCD as the most disabling symptom. Uh, I think I can comment with uh, some conviction about OCD. OCD in prepubertal children is not so common. It's probably less than 1%, but in adults, it's a replicated finding 2 to 3%. So something happens in, in the teenage years to, um, uh, in the evolution of, of OCD, because indeed most adults will tell you that their symptoms began pretty early. So I'm going to try and summarize. There is this idea that ticks tend to present in childhood, peak, and that sometimes with that presentation, ADHD is fairly common. But then other disorders that we see actually may start a little bit later in development, OCD, other anxiety, and there's even some chance for people with Tourette syndrome who um, don't have those other comorbid conditions in uh, early adolescence to actually develop them in later adolescence and shift in some respects the problems that they have from a tick disorder to complications of ADHD over the lifetime, OCD, and major depression, for example. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, and then emphasizing that, that even though we're talking in this segment about prevalence and how common it is, that really the key question to the family and to the patient is uh, the functional outcome. Yeah, I think, I think it really is important over the long haul for, for people who take care of patients with Tourette to be <coughs> prepared to make that shift from maybe focusing on tics and ADHD early to focusing on anxiety and depression and those other conditions later in life.